coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. When there's a cancer diagnosis, it's actually a diagnosis for the family. It's mm -hmm. not just for the patient because it, it, the cascading effects affects so many people. Today on Mayo Clinic Q&A, we'll look at what caregivers can expect when a family member is diagnosed with cancer, advice on how to best care for a loved one, and how caregivers can navigate this difficult time. It's managing communication with families and friends about what's been going on, how things are going. And that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to kind of keep up with those things. It, it can be overwhelming, it can be stressful, it can be burdensome, but I think some people also find a lot of joy in it too. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. When someone we love has cancer, we may find ourselves in the role of a caregiver. Cancer caregivers can be partners, family members, or friends. They are rarely trained for the job of caregiving, but they often become indispensable, taking on tasks like administering medications, helping with side effects, communicating with the cancer care team, and so much more. Joining us to discuss this today is Dr. Joan Griffin, a PhD researcher in healthcare delivery at Mayo Clinic. Welcome to the program, Joan. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I am very excited to learn about this topic today. I practice both pain and palliative medicine, and certainly I think that what we talk about today will help me take better care of my patients as well and understand some of their, their issues. Can you tell me, Joan, what, how do you define a cancer caregiver? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a deceptively simple question and a very complicated an answer, I think, and it all kind of depends on who you are and what lens you're looking at this from. So, you know, as a researcher, I tend to think of this in pretty specific terms. I, I tend to think of family caregiving as, uh, you know, personal services that somebody who provides personal services or support um, to allow someone to meet their physical, mental, emotional needs. Um, and, and allows them to function at, a, at an optimal level that provides them comfort, um, allows them to be capable in their, in their abilities to do things and keeps them safe. And so I think that cancer caregiving is different than dementia caregiving, different than stroke caregiving. Um, but the, the definition issue is really interesting because in my conversations with providers and the research that, that I've done with, um, with providers, they often have a different definition of, of caregiving and caregivers often have a de different definition of what caregiving is. And I'm sure you've seen this in your practice too, where people say, I'm not a caregiver, I'm just their spouse, or yes. I'm not a caregiver, I'm just the daughter. And they don't really sort of engage and, and um, uh, take on this, this title. But as a researcher, we kind of have to have the definition. Um, but it's really interesting to see the kinds of people who um, embrace the definition and those who don't, because for the most part, given the broad definition that I use, almost everybody who is supporting somebody through the cancer journey is a cancer caregiver. So I touched on this very briefly during the intro, but what are some of the roles that you see cancer caregivers taking on to assist uh, patients? I, you know, I think there's the obvious ones and I, I tend to break cancer caregiving into, you know, stages, just like we do when we're thinking about um, cancer treatment. You know, there's the early stages around diagnosis and treatment planning, and then there's the active treatment stage, and then there's survivorship. And it's almost as if there are different roles that happen for cancer caregivers along those, those same stages. You know, there's the obvious things like, um, helping loved ones recover from surgery or managing medications or, um, you know, assuring that people are actually taking their medications, um, checking on symptoms, making sure that their symptoms are managed appropriately. But there's this whole other part to cancer caregiving too, you know, it's, it's managing the financials, it's managing um, the household when somebody, you know, when you have sort of a unit that all of a sudden is disrupted, you have to kind of manage all those things. It's managing the care coordination. A lot of times, I think Mayo is really, really good at um, communicating across the team. But in other systems, you're picking up your chart and you're carrying it from one specialist to the next back to primary care. And that caregiver is often the, 
the the person that ha that holds the tacit knowledge from one you know provider to the other and they're the sort of the the link between all of the different um encounters that they've gone through um it's it's managing communication with families and friends about what's been going on, how things are going. And that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to kind of keep up with those things. And I think it's, um, it, it, it's, it, it can be overwhelming, it can be stressful, it can be burdensome. Um, but I think some people also find a lot of joy in it too. I was going to say, it sounds like it could be very stressful keeping details straight. Is there anything that individuals who know that they're going to be assisting um, a loved one with cancer can do to prepare to become a cancer caregiver? Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a, a lot of things that we can do and a lot of things that we can prepare people for. And I, I think of this sort of broken up into two, two different ways. One is um, the things that you can do to prepare yourself to be a caregiver to provide that care to um, to your loved one, um, things like you know making sure that your insurance is up to to, to speed, um, assuring that you've got time off from work or that you know things around work are kind of managed. But then there's this whole other side of things around self care and making sure that you are. Uh, as fit as possible to be a caregiver because there is such a overwhelming burden um, that can that can go on and it's not necessarily for a short period of time I mean we can kind of sometimes think that it's not just recovering from surgery you know cancer is often turning into a chronic disease and so the whole survivorship period it can go on for a long time so really making sure that you've got things in place to make sure that you're in a good place, you've got social support lined up, you've got that circle of friends who you can, you know, trust and, and touch base with, um, that you've got some kind of exercise routine or something that sort of brings you joy and brings you some kind of solace, some way to kind of help you cope and manage with all the stress that's going to come with that role. So I think that there's sort of two different things. And one of the, I, I think that the self-care for the caregiver is something that we often forget about. And we often don't mm -hmm. emphasize enough on the clinical side. And it's really important because it's a long, hard marathon, I think sometimes, and we really have to prepare ourselves. And not all caregivers are healthy. I mean, I think we have this sort of assumption that there's the benevolent caregiver who, um, one, wants to take on this role, and two, that they're healthy and capable of, of providing these services and doing these things. And, you know, in my research, I've often found that the caregiver, you know, there's sort of like this flip. Sometimes it, the, the caregiver is the one who, um, or, or the, you know, what we call the patient, the, the, the uh, person with cancer is often the one who's caring for the caregiver. Mm -hmm. And then this cancer diagnosis really throws things because all of a sudden the person who has actually had a lot of the illnesses becomes the caregiver. So role that, reversal. That's yes, yes. And I mean, I think sometimes we forget that they have their own health issues that they're managing too, their own um, their own health and family and social issues that they're managing as well. So that self-care part, I think is really critical. How can um, a caregiver uh, attempt to understand what the patient is going through, what their loved one is going through so that they can best support them? You know, I, I, I often point to sort of two different things that happen along the, the cancer journey. Um, and they often happen, they often coincide. One is grief. I mean, I think that patients often um, have to manage and think about issues of grief, of grieving what their life was like, what grieving what they have lost because of the diagnosis, and that issue of uncertainty, not really knowing what's hap going to happen next, mm -hmm. if this treatment's going to work. So I think caregivers have those same issues that they have to think about and manage, but having having them have common issues, this, you know, talking about grief, talking about the uncertainty. I think that because caregivers are going through that, they can probably em empathize a little bit more that their loved one is going through that too. And those might be common areas that they can um, begin to bridge and think about together. Uh, and, and 
help the caregiver better understand what this might be like for that person. And it might also help the patient understand what the caregiver is going through too. I mean, cancer caregivers are often thought of being sort of like the having a, a you know, it's, you know, from the trauma literature, it's more like they, they are exposed to, um, they're almost like a um, a second victim, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I don't want to use the word victim, but you know, they're there's sort of a, a cascade. There's a participating uh, in the experience as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's a, um, a a researcher at University of Michigan, Laurel Nort- Northouse, who's since retired, but she has said that when there's a cancer diagnosis, it's actually a diagnosis for the family. It's mm-hmm. not just for the patient because it, it, the cascading effects affects so many people. So I think that if you can find those things that anchor, that are common across family members, um, that they can begin to, that might help them begin to understand or empathize or um, at least have a better insight as to how that experience really is. That's really important, I think. And one of the things that struck me, Joan, when we were talking about uncertainty and about grief is fear. So yeah. I would imagine that the diagnosis, when people hear the word cancer, it conjures up certain, uh, you know, undeniable uh, feelings uh, in us, I think. And there has to be an incredible amount of fear experienced by both the individual receiving the diagnosis and uh, the, those who love them as well. And I can imagine that plays a big role. Yeah. And, you know, and one of the things that um, we've done some work in is as a caregiver, those fears of uh, of death being left behind, being uh, financially strapped because of the diagnosis, a whole list of fears that caregivers may have, they're not always willing to share those with the patient mm-hmm. because you know it's it's socially undesirable to or, or unacceptable to say to the patient, yeah, I'm really afraid that this diagnosis of yours is going to cause our family, you know, financial ruin. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that caregivers have to keep inside because they don't necessarily, um, you know, if it's their partner who, who's, who has cancer, you know, the things that they typically may have shared, the caregiver is often not going to share those things because it's just not considered to be what a good caregiver does. They're not, it's not seen as being supportive. So there's a lot that's kind of held in. And so there are, um, you know, we've got a couple of different approaches for helping people, um, you know, express those emotions in private ways um, outside of the, 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 you know, purview of the patient that seem to be helpful at, um, at coping with the, with the diagnosis and with the caregiving too. Give me an example of that, Joan. Well, there's a really interesting um, intervention that's been used in trauma um, for people who have experienced trauma where the simple exercise of sitting down and writing 15, 20 minutes a day and very focused writing. So not just, I went to the store, I went and picked up some medication, I came home, I did some laundry because, you know, the bed was soiled, whatever. It's very focused on what your experience is and what the, um, the challenges that you're facing are. So like, uh, you know, it, it, it's almost like being writing a, in a diary, mm-hmm. but um, much more focused than that. It's often, you're often given prompts to, to write from. Okay. And if you do that four or five times a week, the impact on reducing symptoms is actually pretty profound. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's done in a private way, and you know you don't have to worry about grammar or spelling or anything. It, but it's almost like a way to express express your emotions and sort of um, purge them in a way. And it, it's been done a little bit in caregiving. Uh, there's a researcher at ASU who's worked on um, this approach. Uh, with with hematological cancers, with BMT patients and caregivers. Um, and it really seems to have an effect. And it's such a simple and easy, low cost intervention that we could provide resources for caregivers to say, you know, this might be one way for you to kind of begin to think and manage and, you know, um, help you express some of those emotions that you don't necessarily want to talk to 
a, a counselor about, a therapist about, your spouse about. Um, just, but it's just like such an easy, simple thing that we could do to kind of help caregivers manage. Hmm. That's, that's a wonderful example. Yeah. Uh, Joan, I can imagine, and you touched on this earlier, that often the caregiver may become a, a major communicator. So not only with the patient, but with um, loved ones, with um, you know, work, with um, society, I imagine, with uh, the clinic, et cetera. Um, how can a caregiver um, practice or, or attempt to become a, a most effective communicator? Are there tips for that? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, um, you know, this is where those who are really organized sort of thrive and those of us who are not as organized uh, are a little bit more challenged but I mean coming prepared is, is really helpful I mean knowing um, knowing what your insurance covers and what it doesn't all those conversations, having those up front. Um, having an idea of what the communication pattern is going to be between um, your oncology team and your primary care provider, I think is really important. And having had some preparation with your primary care provider before um, uh, the course of treatment starts. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've done a bit of research with, um, with uh, providers. And it's really interesting, um, the, the attitudes and beliefs about caregivers from the provider perspective, because providers are there, and I'm, I guess I mean mostly physicians, are there to help the patient. Their focus is the patient. And at, at Mayo, you know, we know that the patient needs come first. Um, but often what that means is that the caregivers are sort of put to the side a little bit, and they're engaged, but they're engaged um, in relation to the patient. So if the patient's having problems, the caregiver is brought in, but it doesn't, but we're not very good at saying, hey, you're looking really stressed. And I, I'm sure this is really overwhelming to you. And are there things that we can do to kind of reach out to, to you and help you? Because it's out of a provider's purview. It's not where their area of expertise is. And we don't necessarily have resources at the ready to provide caregivers. And so I think if caregivers can know that providers are sometimes hesitant to include them as a vital part of the care team, it might be really important for caregivers to go in prepared and say, you know, we've talked about this and this is what my role is. I mean, I, I think one of the challenges of caregiving is that, especially cancer caregiving, is is that you're still dealing, I mean, you're still trying to be as respectful to the autonomy of the patient as much as possible. And so you wanna make sure that they're the decision maker, they're driving this, mm -hmm. it's their health, it's their body, it's their um, diagnosis that they're trying to manage. But what is the caregiver's role? What is the caregiver going to do? I think having those critical conversations early on with the clinical team and letting the clinical team know that these are the things that the caregiver is comfortable doing and these are the things that they're not. If they're not interested, not interested, if they're not comfortable doing wound care, then it's kind of like, okay, we need to find out something, someone who can help you come in and, and you know, change bandages. Or if they're really queasy around blood, um, or any kind of bodily functions, you know, I think that the clinical team needs to know that, the, but the caregiver also needs to know that they need to express those things to the clinical care team and say, here's kind of where my comfort zone is. <laughs> and outside of that, I'm not going to do so well. And so I want to make sure that the person has really good care, but these are the things I just can't do. And so some of those critical conversations early on, I think are really important. I think that's really helpful, even to me as a provider. I often identify during the conversation who the caregiver is and who the keeper of the lists is. Yeah. And so many times it's the caregiver. It'll be the husband, the wife, the child, and I will get to the end of the conversation with the patient themselves and then turn to the caregiver and say, now, how many more questions do you have left on your list for me? And we'll turn to those and kind of follow that, you can kind of establish that, um, what their role is, and it makes them, they often think of things that the 
patient themselves wouldn't think to ask you. So it actually is very useful. That's great. Well, and, and they often think of those things because they affect them. You know, if you're sure. expecting them to be able to go home and manage really complex meds, they may have a whole list of questions that the patient may not necessarily be thinking right. about. But the caregiver is like, oh my gosh, this is a big responsibility. I really need to understand this stuff. So you know, those, those exactly are the questions I think are the ways that caregivers can better communicate is if they kind of know um, where their uncomfortable places are and what they are willing to do and what they're not. I've noticed that about pain symptoms and other side effects as well, that often the patient will kind of downplay that when you ask, but then the caregiver will say, now, wait, I remember last evening or in the last week, I've noticed this. And yeah. so sometimes the caregiver can be really helpful in terms of delineating some of the topics that need to be managed as far as symptom management. Absolutely. And, you know, it, 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 pain is just so interesting too, because, you know, when we're in pain, we're not, we, we kind of turn into bad reporters. I mean, we don't necessarily know what was going on because so much of our energy is put towards trying to cope with the pain and manage the pain where caregivers kind of come in from that different angle and say, you know, you were, you were not actually managing that situation very well, or you were having a really hard time at this time of day and they can give that different perspective. So I think that they're, they're, an added value all the time, but they can also provide, um, uh, you know, nuances that we're not necessarily getting just from the patient. Yeah, that's great. Joan, tell me how caregiving is different when um, an individual is working with a child who has cancer versus uh, another adult. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, it just to kind of back up a little bit. I think one of the interesting things about caregiving is, is that, you know, people often call it informal caregiving and that's sort of becoming out modish. They, I think caregivers don't like that term informal caregiver because what they feel that they're doing is actually really important and informal mm -hmm. makes it seem not as important. But I think the difference between a family caregiver, broadly defined family, um, and uh, you know, a healthcare provider is that they have this emotional bond. And so everything is done with this, you know, deep emotional tie to that person. And when you've got the emotional bonds, it just changes everything. And I think when you're, when you're a caregiver to a child who has cancer, that emotional bond, I think, is even different than if it's a spouse or a parent. Um, and part, I think, because the, you know, coming back to the grief and uncertainty issues, I think children don't have as clear of an understanding about grief and loss mm -hmm. and uncertainty as parents do. Um, and so parents or, or adults who are caring for a child um, sort of have the vision and have the, the you know, they can see the horizon and, and what um, the path may, might look like for the child, but the child, I think, is sort of here in the in, in the moment, unless they're you know a uh, um, uh, you know adolescent or late adolescent, uh, they may have a better understanding. So I think that they almost take on more of the responsibility because they're they know the those that the, they know about grief, they know about uncertainty, and they don't necessarily want to share that or put that on the child. Mm -hmm. um, so there's almost a double burden of caring for somebody in the physical um, tasks that happen, but the emotional burden of caring for a child just to see, seems to be so much more overwhelming. And to that point, I think that self-care part is just so much more important than for um, for people who are taking care of children with cancer, just because uh, it almost seems like the emotional weight of that um, can uh, can affect you so much faster and so much harder. So I think that self care and those self care practices and establishing those really early on are pretty critical. Mm -hmm. Much of what we've described here today, Joan, sounds like a more than full-time job to me. What advice do you have for caregivers who are also continuing to work outside of the home or maintain a, now that COVID has hit and so many people are working from home, maintaining a 
a job or a career while they are caring for someone? Um, it's really tough. I mean, I think it's tough because we don't necessarily have the um, the laws in place to help support caregivers. I mean, we have FMLA, but um, and in our FMLA laws have changed to be more supportive. Um, and, and there's more that is being presented to Congress, I think, to, um, to support caregivers who are working. Um, you know, I, I think having a really clear understanding of leave policies um, and understanding what your rights as a caregiver are. Um, and you know, it, it sounds, um, it, it sounds like legalese, but it really is important to kind of understand, you know, what's your right of taking time off? Is your, you know, are you able to come back to your job after a leave of absence? I think it really hits hard for people who are in either gig work or intermittent work or work that doesn't necessarily have a really strong benefit package that guarantees FMLA or, or I shouldn't say um, that because everybody is guaranteed FMLA, but doesn't have guaranteed vacation and paid sick time off. Um, it's a it's a national problem, I think, that we're dealing with and not one that I have really clear answers for. Uh, but I think as our population begins to age and we don't have as big of a pool of caregivers, um, this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue for us because it's very hard to manage work and caregiving. Um, having said that, I do think that work sometimes can be a haven from the stress of caregiving. It can help sort of give you something else to do besides the, the stress and overwhelming nature of caregiving. So, um, you know, it does provide some structure and focus that sometimes your life as a caregiver doesn't necessarily provide you. So, um, you know, it, it is, I would say it's a very tough one. And I think it's especially tough if you're holding the insurance. And so you're having to continue to work because your loved one is, um, is not able to because of treatment or because they're um, disabled. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, it, it is definitely a challenging question without a lot of really clear answers. Mm -hmm. Joan, one thing that has struck me as we were speaking today is um, something that I've often shared with our residents and fellows. I specialize in both pain medicine and palliative medicine, which means I care for patients who have chronic medical illnesses such as cancer and help with symptom management, uh, goals of care, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that was profoundly um, remarkable to me when I started in this practice of medicine was that I had always sort of imagined that as people have a difficulty in life like cancer or face um, even worse, sometimes face a death or some significant morbidity from their illness, that they would draw together and that it would improve their relationship. But that's not necessarily so. Sometimes it must be very difficult to be a caregiver when the relationship has been a difficult relationship. And, um, and that how the caregiver interacts with uh, the individual requiring the care or how, who has cancer can be challenging, I'm sure. What advice would you give in situations like that? I, I think you've really um, put your finger on it. I think that there's, it, it's a very challenging thing. And, um, uh, we have a, a study going on right now, which is actually in the palliative care space, where we're um, recruiting family caregivers of people who have received palliative care. Um, and there's a, a, the people who go into the intervention arm receive um, visits from a, a video visits from a nurse. And much of what the nurses are managing are, is exactly this. It's a lot of relationship issues. It, it's, um, you know, I never had a good relationship with my mom and now she's dying and I'm expected to take care of her. Um, this idea of choosing to be a caregiver is in the literature and in research is shown to be very predictive of caregiver burden. And so if people choose to be a caregiver, they sort of take it on and don't feel as much of a burden. If they, if they do not choose it and they feel like it's thrust upon them, 
it really is an indicator or a risk for downstream um, mental health and physical health consequences. So it, it's a critical and important issue. I, some of the you know really practical things that we encourage people to do is really um, you know make sure that they sort of know where their boundaries are. And um, being a caregiver to somebody who you've got a contentious relationship with or a difficult relationship with doesn't, allow, doesn't mean that they can treat you poorly or, um, and vice versa, that you can't treat them poorly too. Um, but you kind of have to know what you're going to take and what you're not, uh, and that's okay. And I, but I think that's where um, counseling really can mm -hmm. kind of step in and be helpful because um, families are, are, are messy. Families are mm -hmm. difficult. I mean, there, there's very few cases where you see uh, a caregiver who doesn't have, um, you know, some, a family member or that where there's not some type of um, strife in the family. Families are hard to manage over a long period of time. Um, so I think communicating that with your clinical team and making sure that they know that there are some challenges. So they're not thinking that you're being um, negligent or, uh, or, or not providing optimal care, that there are reasons possibly behind the challenges for caregiving. That's really important. But I think seeking out counseling um, is really uh, an important avenue for people who are really struggling with some of the communication issues that can happen during the, the cancer journey. That's a great point, Joan, because <clears throat> you pointed out earlier that the stressors involved with these diagnoses and the, and the ongoing care and the chronic nature of this could stress even the, the best of relationships. And so probably an even more important time for self-care uh, as well, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'd agree. Joan, what other research is going on in this area? You know, it's a fascinating area um, for research because it's really burgeoning. I think that there's a lot that's beginning to happen on um, the policy end, but also at the clinical, the care delivery end too. On the policy end, there's a lot of recognition that um, family caregivers have an incredibly important role in the care of patients and in the way that we manage our healthcare systems overall. Um, you know, we know that if, if we actually had to pay family caregivers for what they do, it would break the healthcare system in our country. They provide so much unpaid care and support um, that it exceeds you know, I think like 10 times over what the Medicare and Medicaid budget is. So wow. their contribution is huge and incredibly important for our healthcare system to, to stay afloat. Um, and I think that's beginning to be recognized through policy. So there's a lot more uh, around um, uh, trying to identify who the family caregivers are, because that's not always clear cut either and making sure that they're aware. So, I mean, there are situations where people are admitted to the hospital and family caregivers are not aware that there's been an admission. So we now have laws in place um, that uh, require hospitals to notify the family caregiver that there's been an admission. Um, so the patient has to identify who the family caregiver is. That caregiver right. is then notified, and um, and then they're they're required to provide um, uh, discharge planning and dis discharge support right before the um, discharge from the hospital. And that might seem relatively obvious, and like hospitals are already doing that. But when you get into the details, it's much more complicated. Finding the right person, documenting them in the medical record, making sure that they're available for discharge. And we're, when we're talking about you know, people who live in rural areas, it even gets more complicated because they have um, a lot more challenges for queuing up the resources at discharge and um, getting to the hospital in order to provide care. So there's policy that's being done around that and research around that. More on the care delivery side, there's a lot more on uh, identifying caregivers and trying to, um, and doing interventions to assure that they don't 
sort of get caught under this huge burden of care and that they are able to, um, you know, optimize their own health and make sure that they keep themselves as healthy as possible. Um, because I think that they're of this bigger understanding that they're so important um, that if, if the burden of care ends up affecting caregivers, we know that those patients will end up in the hospital again too. So we need to make sure that they're as sort of ready and able to provide the care as possible. Um, so I think there's, and then there's a lot of um, sort of the intrapersonal work that's being done too on resiliency, building resiliency, um, you know, there, uh, Sherry Chesek, who's in our nursing research group, is doing work um, based on Dr. Sood's um, resiliency mm -hmm. um, approach. So there's there's quite a bit of work, and I think in the next five years, we're going to see um, a huge burgeoning of caregiver research, both in cancer and in other areas, too. Right now, a lot of the work has been put into dementia caregiving, and dementia caregiving is a very different thing right now than cancer caregiving. Um, but I think that cancer caregiving is, because it's becoming, you know, survivorship is, is mm -hmm. we now have survivors who are, la who are living a, a much longer time um, with chronic condition with, you know, sort of like the, um, the long standing issues that come with cancer treatment, um, that cancer caregivers are doing this for a longer period of time too. And so I think a lot of the work is going to be put into survivorship too, I think for caregivers. Interesting. Yeah. Joan, if our listeners are interested in more resources, where could they find them? There's a lot of great resources out there. Um, uh, we are building up our Mayo Clinic resources as we speak, um, and there'll be more coming out on those. Um, there's a National Alliance for Caregiving, which is a great resource for all kinds of um, caregiving issues. Um, Caring Bridge is a great resource for people who uh, are, are trying to keep um, in touch with family. And there's a lot of online, really great online tools to help people um, manage and communicate with family members and with their, their providers, um, even like, you know, symptom management and um, uh, and symptom tracking. So there's a lot of great tools. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think. So I, 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 there are resources out there. A lot of them come down to like the American Cancer Society has a cancer caregiving tab on their webpage. So if you multiple myeloma society, so a lot of times the societies or the um, type of cancer oh, will sure. have advocacy groups and they have really good resources as well. Um, and there are a lot of support groups online and, you know, those people have great resources as well. I mean, sometimes they tap into resources that I've never heard about and they're really good and reliable. So I think getting involved with um, an online cancer support group can often sort of open up this whole new world of resources that um, may not be easily find accessible or searchable in other ways. Oh, that's wonderful. What a great conversation. Thank you for being here today, Joan. My pleasure. You know, as I said, I love talking about this and it's a passion for me. So thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's wonderful. Our thanks to Dr. Joan Griffin for being here today to talk to us about cancer caregiving. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. And we wish each of you a very wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.